Hello, it's Peter Wright and Kathleen Beauvais with another episode of The Yacking Show. And we're bringing you another episode of the Harmony, your path to wholeness channel. We have a repeat guest, but I'm not going to give the game away. Just to tell you, it's a subject that I find absolutely fascinating. So first, let's say hello to Kathleen, co-host. Hi, Kathleen. How are you today? I'm doing great, Peter. Thank you for that. And thank you also very much for tuning in to our show. We so appreciate having you. And as Peter mentioned, we have the great privilege of welcoming back Douglas Mulhall to the show. Hello, Douglas. Welcome back. How are you? Hi, Kathleen. Hi, Peter. I'm great. I just Hi. plugged in my I just plugged in my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> ah, last minute emergency. Well, it, you certainly sound good. So that's yes, fine. Yes. <laughs> well, just to give a, a brief recap to our audience, Douglas is a journalist, author, and award-winning documentary filmmaker. He co-founded Alastrin Therapeutics, dedicated to reversing cardiovascular damage. He specializes in helping people live long, healthy lives. Uh, today, he's here to yak with us about epigenetics, which is the study of how the environment and other factors can change the way that genes are expressed. So let's just jump right in. Douglas, I've just given a brief description of epigenetics, but can you elaborate further and why scientists believe this is so important. It's actually uh, a very complicated story made simple, Kathleen. <laughs> uh, and that is this epigenetics is the on off switch for your genes. So we've heard so much about genetics and about CRISPR, you know, and about snipping little bits on and off of your genes. This is not that at all. Okay. So epigenetics actually means above genetics. It's an interesting um, uh, word. Now, the reason for that is because actually epigenetic effects are far more prevalent in triggering our health and our sickness than our genetic makeup. And the good news about that is that although many people hear that they're genetically disposed to this or that problem, it doesn't have to be. <laughs> right. So there's lots of people that you know seem to be genetically disposed to things that they, they never they never get those those problems. And that is because of the environment that they are living in. So basically what has been shown is that 70 to 90 percent of all diseases are actually triggered by epigenetic factors rather than genetic factors. So you can fully understand how very important these epigenetics are. So it's literally the on-off switch. It's a an event that triggers your body to put certain chemicals onto your DNA, and it switches those genes on and off. And those genes then tell you what to do. Right. So the other huge advantage of epigenetics over uh, what I'll call genetic fiddling, uh, is it's reversible. So you can unlearn, your body can unlearn what it has uh, learned. So that's just a brief introduction to it. Well, oh, it's very like, interesting. you know, I, I think of this and maybe not the correct analogy, but I always think of, you know, you often will see families, uh, children will say, well, I'm heavy set because, well, my parents were heavy set. That's just our build. That's just the way, you know, our, our family is. But then you look at their diet. Well, naturally, if they're, you know, they grew up with a certain diet, then they as adults will also have the same diet. And that's and, right. Yes. Right. And unless they make a, a change to that and start eating you know, better foods and, and what have you, so that they become, you know, thinner, they think, well, I'm just built this way. This is how my family's built. Well, and there's an interesting adjunct to that, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> actually, sometimes events that happen to your grandparents can affect you, not because your genes have been changed, but because a gene has been switched off, uh, switched on, sorry. And that switched on gene this, the switch has also been passed down through to your parents and, and to you. And I'll give you a classic example of this. Mm. What has been discovered is that um, if the grandparents were exposed to one of the first pesticides ever used, DDT, DDT, right. yeah. Yeah, they're more, they're, they're more likely to get diabetes. 
Isn't that interesting? Isn't that what they but, call miasm, uh, what you've just described? Uh, you know something? I'm going to beg ignorance on that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no problem. So, uh, I mean, basically what's happening is that the, the switched on gene has been passed down from generation to generation, but you can switch it off. Right. You can switch it off exactly through the things that you spoke about, and that is a different approach to diet, uh, you know, a different approach to sugars, and all of those things. And this is especially important in children between zero and two. Mm -hmm. So a huge amount of the epigenetic effects that determine the rest of our lives um, happen between the age of zero and two. So epigenetics is the major factor that's affecting kids. And I'll just give you, it's not just limited to food. Uh, it's, uh, it's also, for example, if a child is exposed to a traumatic event, that can actually literally turn on uh, inflammatory genes uh, as, as a defensive uh, reaction. Mm -hmm. And out of that, you get chronic inflammation. So then if you're not aware of that, uh, because you've been exposed to this trauma, every time you're exposed to something that's similar, your body has this same mm response. Mm -hmm. And so that if you recognize that, then you can unlearn that uh, that response. So wow. this is this is a really really important field, and it's funny because literally thousands of papers have been published about it, but it's mm -hmm. people aren't just simply you know not aware of it. Right. Uh, and and so yeah, the on off switch for your genes. Wow, that is amazing. That's amazing. So you, you've explained very well the difference between genetics and epigenetics, and and <clears throat> epi of course denoting above or on top of. So this this brings us into the whole nature versus nurture debate, doesn't it? <laughs> well, that's the funny thing about it, because, Peter, uh, you hit the nail on the head. It turns out that this whole argument over uh, nature versus nurture is nonsense because actually nature is nurture. Yeah, nature uh, is what nurture. Happened, yeah, you, you yeah. have this interplay between your environment and your genes. And that interplay is the combination of nature and, and nurture of that course. actually determines the outcome of your life. So it's a false argument. Is yep. it more nature or is it more nurture? No, it's the combination of them that really has the huge effects on how well and how long we live. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, back to you. so you've mentioned that early childhood tra traumas can apparently affect the epigenetic changes, but how do you go to unlearn? You said to the, this, these expressions can be unlearned. How, how can they go about that? Especially if the impact is, is greatest between the ages of what, zero to two, as you mentioned. Yeah. Well, in the case of emotional trauma that has epigenetic effects, the first thing is to uh, help the child understand what they've just been through and help them learn how to deal with it. I'll just give you an example. It's kind mm -hmm. of like, um, you know, when I have my normal panic attacks 35 times a day. <laughs> uh, no, just kidding. But, you know, when you're really <clears throat> like this, yeah. uh, you're, you're advised to do deep breathing exercises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And have you notice after about 20 minutes of doing deep breathing, you calm right out. So that's those, those epigenetic switches being turned off. So, mm. uh, and, I, and on that score, it's very important. I mentioned epigenetic effects can be uh, happen over generations, but they can also happen in milliseconds. So mm. it's a very wide spread eh, of the yeah, time, sure. depending on the kind of uh, response. And just to get into it a little bit, uh, just a tiny little bit of the science, Sure. Uh, the, chemi the chemical change when the, uh, that happens uh, that affects your genes is actually called DNA methylation. And that is your body actually taking one of uh, hundreds and hundreds of chemicals and chemical combinations and methylating that gene so that it actually switches on or off. And usually it's not with just one gene. It's a whole bunch a of lot. them, which is what, you know, makes it so, uh, so complicated. So it's actually a biochemical reaction that can either be triggered by your physical, your chemical, or your emotional environment. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Wow. So if the switch is switched, 
<clears throat> if you have a reaction because of epigenetics as a child, uh, does that can that become? I think you've answered it, but let me try and get this thought out with some clarity. Does that become self perpetuating? So let's take the case of helicopter parenting. Uh, sometime in the eighties and nineties, parents became very protective of children, and children suddenly Heli did not have the helicopter freedom. Helicopter parents. <laughs> yeah, freedom. Kids didn't have the freedom that we had, right? As we were kids, yeah. and especially freedom me. to fail. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And and in all aspects, I mean, I used to get on my horse and ride miles away from home across farms, and my parents would never worry about me. Um, used to get on my bicycle and ride in traffic and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and we got hurt, Peter. By the way, of course. Oh yeah, skin <laughs> fall off the bike, of fall off the that's roof. Right. That's why. That's why we're, we have when we're young, we have such you know flexible bones. Yeah. So. I brought my kids up in a similar way. But what I'm saying is that what happened in, I think it was the 80s, 90s, parents became overprotective. Um, and I believe unnecessarily so, because I don't believe there's any more dangers to kids than there ever were. And it's just well put more publicized. So does that mean that they bring that generation up and they're going to add to it for the next generation and, and just think it's worse and worse? Well, yeah. Again, you've got to unlearn it because the generation that's coming up now, I think it's happening a little uh, differently. Uh, there's a there's a whole activist uh, generation now that's coming up. The the teenagers are are much more, for example, you know, politically uh, active than than the generation behind them. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a risk. But on the other hand, I think uh, that some parents of parents or you know parent children of parents have recognized that when they're raising their kids and they mm -hmm. say well you know my parents coddled me too much and i think you know that type of thing has to stop but i will give you an example because you use this um uh, this this term about uh, you know it accumulates mm -hmm. i'll tell you what does accumulate and we talked about this in the last uh, episode heavy metals yes so well that's an epigenetic effect heavy metals have one of the worst epigenetic effects that you can possibly imagine because it turns on pro-inflammatory genes, carcinogenic uh, activities, and it builds up over time. Of course. So unless yeah. you're getting rid of that stuff, you're getting a bioaccumulative epigenetic effect. So that's mm -hmm. an example of how things can can pile can up. Accumulate. Right. I, that's right. But I Going back to the kids, I, I agree 100% what you're saying about heavy metal. Going back to the kids, and I don't think I used this example in our last episode, but when I was 10 or 12, 12, I think, uh, we went back to school after summer break, which was very short in Africa compared to Northern Hemisphere. And our teacher said, you probably noticed Jerry is not in class today. And we said, oh, yeah. She said, well, I'm sorry to say that his parents went to the coast at uh, during the holiday, a place called Byra, and he drowned in the sea. Um, we've sent a message of condolence to the parents. Open your books at page 10 or 12, and, and we're carrying on reading. That was it. There was no fuss. There was no counseling. And at the break time, a few of us said, oh, I must be terrible to drown. I wonder what it's like. Shame. Poor Jerry. End of story. Right? No trauma, no problem. Whereas now, if there's a minor incident, kids go for counseling. So are we not reinforcing that ill effect of lack of resilience by what's happening at the moment? Well... Uh, you know, I'm not sure I want to be a, a kid this day. I mean, yes and no. But the problem is the story of the parents taking their child to the sea and, this, you know, the child uh, drowning. Mm -hmm. Imagine being a parent today in a lot of cities in the United States and hearing that uh, 20 of uh, your uh, your child's classmates were murdered by mm -hmm. yep. someone with a gun. So this the this massive epidemic mm -hmm. of these uh, these shooting incidents is having a huge epigenetic effect on a whole generation, not only of children, but of parents, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're starting to wonder eh, when, the, when their kids are going to school. So uh, in some senses, yeah, you know, it's good not to make a big deal of these things. That's life. Uh, and, it, you know, on the other side, that's a big warning sign saying, gee, maybe we would better change the way that we're doing that stuff. Sure. No, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Kathleen, back to you. So I'm, I was just thinking. So if 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 the trauma affects or it's is is affecting the person and it carries on through generations, causing an inflammatory response, but you have the 
ability to to change that don't you need to know don't you need to know what it was that triggered yeah. all of this in order to absolutely be, but you may Knowledge not know that especially if we're going back generations though i'll give you an well, example that, that's that's Douglas. that's a really good example yes Go i ahead. and i have no idea i have no idea uh well i'll just tell you the story it's just very briefly uh, when I was a child, I must have been about three or four years old, but I remember it like it was yesterday. The, the, the There was a house fire right next door to where we lived. And of course, I remember we were evacuated. I, I remember a fireman um, carrying me out and putting me yep. in a police car. I don't ever recall feeling fear. I don't. But I will tell you, that for the longest time, I know this sounds so irrational, and I can't believe I'm even saying this out loud. For years and years and years, I would not light a candle. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't light a match. Yeah. There was something about fire. I just, mm -hmm. and I, I think back to that incident, but that incident wasn't what triggered it. I know it wasn't because I never felt fear then about it. Well, uh, you don't remember feeling fear. No, I don't. Uh, yeah, right. So that doesn't mean you it it didn't have an impact uh, on you. But I'll answer what you just said. I'll answer this way. Mm -hmm. The advantage that the new generations have is that they have a massive amount of data about their childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just look at all the images and everything else, the billions and trillions of images of our lives that are being stored. And in fact, what we're doing is we are building up uh, an epigenetic record of okay. our lives. And uh, this is being translated also into something that's known as transhumanism, where, uh, for example, uh, your memories are actually all recorded uh, for not just for posterity, but with the idea that somewhere, somewhere down the road, if enough of that material is available, your your consciousness can be transplanted into something else. And that's a very interesting scenario, but that's the extreme side of our epigenetic lives are becoming very well recorded. And as they are, I think that, I mean, some people can say, well, it's too much information, but there's another thing that's come along that's going to help us with that, and that's AI. Mm -hmm. So if you combine those two things, all this data about yourself and the AI tools that we're beginning uh, to use, you can simply ask the AI tool, well... I seem to have this really bad habit or this fear. Can you go back into my record and find anything that would have triggered that type of mm. thing? And because the AI tool has been trained in recognizing epigenetic effects, it'll do that in about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And any of us who have uh, had the experience of going on to perplexity, which is the new AI designed AI chatbot. <laughs> For those of you who haven't heard about it, it's called Perplexity. It's the first chatbot to actually be designed by AI, mm -hmm. and uh, it's 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 actually a lot better in some ways than uh, than ChatGTP. Mm. And uh, so that shows you how fast it's moving. So these type of bots can be trained on your data, and yeah. then you can use them as tools to understand more about your past and what i call that is remembering the past into the future <laughs> yeah yeah that's, wow. that's, yeah yeah and it's it's a very important evolutionary part of the way that we are changing as a human species uh ai isn't only changing what we do it's it's changing what we are and that's going to have huge epigenetic implications right right Possibly some bad ones. Oh well, yeah, that's well. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, you've heard um, you know Elon Musk uh, talking doom and gloom, and the you know the thousand top uh, technologists who signed the letter saying you know AI is going to destroy us all if we just let it loose. But the fact of the matter is, it has been let loose. <laughs> oh yeah. So, no, I agree. You know, hang agree. on for the ride. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> my 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 fear is people using it for ulterior motives. In other words, uh, ruining people's reputations, uh, getting people convicted of crimes they didn't commit. Um, yeah, there's there's uh, uh, there's a dark side that I think could be could be quite tricky. 
But again, if you allow governments to control it, you're opening another, well, not opening a can of worms, you're creating another problem. So I don't know what the answers are going to be, quite honestly. Right. Ah. Well, um, just, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Peter. No, carry on. Well, I was just saying, you know, sort of telescoping back on the the epigenetics thing, the, the, the first thing that people ask is, well, you know, what can I do? And I, I do have to say, that some things that just normally make sense um, are actually having good epigenetic uh, effects on you. Just on the normal things like, you know, getting a lot of exercise, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you're older. I cannot emphasize enough the importance. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the 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 trends around the world that have been shown of super centenarians are very clear, and that is. They all have at least three hours of vigorous exercise a day. Three hours. Three hours and, a day. Yeah, wow. three yeah. hours. And these are people in their 90s and 100s who are climbing up hillsides and mountainsides, um, herding cattle on their horses, uh, you know, doing things uh, like that. And that's because that type of activity turns on all the right genes. And so... You know, it's things that we've done that just make sense for so long. We're we're putting the epigenetic um, sort of label on it, but it is a good label in the sense that it helps you to better understand what's happening. It's the same thing with a really really healthy uh, diet. Mm -hmm. So when you start to combine those things, um, and you know, uh, there's even a couple of services out there, and I can't name them right now, that are developing um, epigenetic regimes uh, based on personalized medicine. Really? And that's, yeah, that's really interesting because yeah, basically yeah. it says, okay, here's the genes that are getting turned, it off, uh, turned on and off by these and these uh, activities. And here's what you can do. Last year, I was at a conference where, uh, you know, a, a founder of one of the startups in this, he actually described how they're doing this with their uh, patients and it's absolutely fascinating because they're quantifying it. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're taking a hundred different measurements of your body. People are you know they're using wearables and uh, this is incredible. What's you know what's what's going on? Wow, isn't that clever? And then the combining that with you, with the person's existing lifestyle, stress factors, and all sorts of other things, right? Presumably to to come up with this tailor made program yeah and imagine how complex that really is wow, wow. so yeah. uh you know and i just have to get back to the topic of ai because yeah. i i can't overemphasize enough how crucial this is to everything that we're doing right now in the biomedical field i'll just give you an example there are now more than 100 companies that are offering ai services to biomedical uh, companies over wow. one 100. 100. That's gone from almost zero, uh, you know, four years ago to more than 100. And what so, does that look like exactly? Well, it's really interesting because, and here, here's the reason why it's really interesting, is, you know why our drugs are so expensive? <laughs> our drugs are so expensive because 95% of them fail, fail before, right. before they get to what we call the bedside. So when yep. they're being translated from bench to bedside, 95% of them fail for many, many, many reasons. Uh, bad science, uh, inability to understand the regulatory uh, uh, process, mm -hmm. uh, unexpected cross reactions during very expensive phase three clinical trials. And by the way, that's where most of the failures happen. Yep. <laughs> After they've spent a hundred million bucks, right? Yep. So imagine, if most of the failures are happening uh, in that last, you know, 5% of time, but the last 95% of the money, that piles up in a hurry. So we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars on failures, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with failure, but a 95% failure rate. And so what happens is that the drug companies have to make up for that. So how do they make mm -hmm. up for it? It's in the drugs that succeed. Yeah. So that's why we're paying through the nose for drugs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, answering Kathleen's question, that's exactly what a lot of these AI tools are actually being designed to do. They're predicting, much better predicting uh, biodistribution of uh, drugs, uh, toxicology, um, uh, big data on 
which patient groups will actually be best suited uh, to wow. that drug. And guess what? Epigenetic effects yeah. of the drugs. Yeah. So this is, and this is going like wildfire, just like wildfire. It's just, it's happening so, so quickly. And let's hope that what will come out of that is a reversal of that to 95% successes and 5% failures. Mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. would transform our whole drug system, our whole healthcare system, because costs would absolutely plummet. And most importantly, the time to mar market would also uh, plummet. Yeah. But yeah. having said that, pharmaceutical companies would not like that. <laughs> Well, you'd be surprised. Uh, you know, I I, uh, I hesitate to, I'll, I'll just give an example. Uh, you know, United Therapeutics is a company that uh, is run by uh, Martine Rothblatt, who is one of my favorite people in the world. She's also the highest paid female executive in the United States. Mm. So Martine's daughter um, has um, peripheral, uh, sorry, uh, has uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. So this is a, a, a rare disease in children, uh, but basically your pulmonary artery develops very high hypertension and it kills off the artery and it kills off the lung and then it kills off you. And so Martine, who is a, a successful lawyer, but her claim to fame is that she developed a technology uh, that allowed for satellite radio. Uh, so, but she pivoted from that when her daughter uh, got ill and she found a drug that had been developed over, over 20 years previously. And, uh, she, uh, brought it through the regulatory process. And, uh, today it's known as remodulin and remodulin is one of the very few successful drugs in attenuating the effects of this, uh, disease. Now, why is that important? Because today... United Therapeutics is a, a large pharma company that started from nothing when nothing. all the big pharma companies wouldn't do anything with this drug that was sitting on the shelf. So my message is there's hope, uh, but sure. there's hope in places that people aren't used to looking. So there are mm -hmm. a lot of niches out there that you can use to actually create a pharma company. And mm -hmm. actually that's what we're doing with our company, which is Elastrin Therapeutics. And our niche is, as we talked about in the last program, the elastic fiber that drives every breath you take and every step you make. Right. So Kathleen, answering your question, I couldn't agree with you more. And you know, big pharma, we created them, eh? We created them yeah. because we asked them to fix our problem and just keep us going. We didn't ask them to cure us. We just said, well, I got a heart condition, you know, can you keep my blood vessels open a little longer? And uh, so that's what they did, mm -hmm. uh, because at that time it was very hard to find cures for those things. So we created mm -hmm. a monster. We did. And that monster has become self-perpetuating. But my personal experience has been that there's real hope out there that we're going to see a whole new generation of pharma companies and they're already... Mm -hmm. Uh, springing up. So mm. personally, I'm, you know, I'm, and also I would say there are some good people in big pharma. <laughs> you just have to look for them. Look for them. <laughs> they're, they're not all run by marketers. <laughs> <laughs> now the big but pharma just... people would be surprised to hear me say that because I am not a fan of big pharma. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, a founder of one of the upstarts. Mm -hmm. So we shall see. Right. We shall see. But that, that idea of AI uh, in biohealth is, is going to save so much time and money because presumably let, let's say your startup has come up with a concept for a new topical treatment for eczema right and you start doing your research you think we've got a winner here now with this ai interpretation you could program that to go and look at every successful and failed eczema product has ever been produced over the last hundred years why did they fail why were they successful which type of Correct. people did they work Correct. on which Correct. was the active in, you you can get all that done as you say in 30 seconds instead yep. of years and years of people looking up old books and old internet records wow yeah, i can see why that's important mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and and there's there's something uh, very deep behind that and that is a mouse is not a human surprise so yep. we are testing our drugs uh, and creating diseases artificially in mice 
Mm -hmm. and it doesn't translate. No. It doesn't translate well at all. This is one of the huge problems. And everyone has been looking for a bridge, and that bridge is AI. Mm -hmm. Because AI can look at the mouse, look at the human, um, look at the different types of conditions that are in that human, look at all the mouse experiments that have failed and why they have failed, and bridge that translating gap between the mouse and the human. And the Nothing human. could yeah. be more important. Yeah, and and just a simple version of that might be they look very quickly at the mouse, say, well, that's one reason why it's not going to work in a human. Don't waste any more time, All right? Yes, in other words, and fail quickly. Fail quickly. Right. Might save two, three years of experiments and trials before you get into the human. Yeah, oh, wow. And, and huge, huge expense. It's yeah. just, you know, the, the expenses are just so enormous. And so, um, yeah, and, you know, we're looking at this right now very, uh, very seriously in our company. And, uh, I mean, just generally, I've been very interested in it ever since I wrote Our Molecular Future in 2002 and predicted that in around 2025, AI would start to disrupt our whole society. So I was off by two years, but <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there we go. Wow. <laughs> wow. So... Yeah, I'm going to go a slightly different tack, but it's one that you're a expert in and B um, can talk very knowledgeably about, and that's longevity and aging. So you, you said that the epigenetics can change your aging clock, or it could be an, called an epigenetic clock. So how how does that work? T tell us more about that. Well, I just give you one beautiful example, and it's related to exactly what we do, and that is. Uh, Elastic fiber. So the, just for people who didn't watch the last show, elastic fiber is the stuff that allows your air sacs to expand and contract. It allows your heart to expand and contract. It lets your arteries flex in and out to actually help carry the blood along. Uh, it's in every tendon, every ligament, and almost every organ in the body. And most people have never heard of it. It's called elastin mm -hmm. fiber. Uh, so what happens to elastin fiber is partly genetics and partly epigenetics. The genetic part that not even the world's top experts, because I've spoken to them all, have been able to figure out, they think it's genetic, they're not absolutely sure, is that our epigenetic, our, our sorry, um, <laughs> elastin clock stops ticking around the age of 25 or 30, stops producing the elastin fiber. Mm -hmm. It stops assembling it. Mm -hmm. And the result of that is that before it was being sort of replaced and it's a very long lived protein. Now it's not being replaced. So it starts to fall apart. When it starts to fall apart, it sends out a help me signal and you get inflammation. And because it can't be fixed, you get chronic inflammation. Well, that chronic inflammation is one of the major reasons why we age. So one of the major contributors to that isn't just the fact that our body stops producing elastin fiber. It's also, guess what? Infection heavy metals, and diet. So they can always, always have major impacts on chipping little pieces off the protective covering of elastin fiber. That is one of the leading contributors to aging. So mm -hmm. imagine if you had something that got rid of the heavy metals, that got rid of the nasty impacts from, from diet, and that's what we're doing with heavy metals uh, by actually showing that you can regenerate the elastin fiber. You can kickstart that process that somehow has stopped inside of us. And we have shown this uh, not only in animals, but our one of our sister companies has shown it in humans. So they have proven that you can actually reassemble elastic fiber in people who have aortic aneurysms. Wow. And the result of that is that they have prevented the aneurysms from bursting. So if you translate that to the whole human body, imagine if you start restoring this elasticity, you know, yeah. in yeah. your body, uh, it's phenomenal. So uh, that's, that's a, a beautiful example of how you can translate into genetically, uh, sorry, epigenetically driven healthy um longevity. longevity i don't like to, right. yeah i don't like to call it aging anymore no. because uh <laughs> healthy longevity is sort of a, just a i think it's a more accurate description of what we're talking about 
Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. For sure. Kathleen. So, so how is epigenetics uh, related to mental health? Ah, that's a really good question. It, it's extremely closely related, going in both directions. Mm -hmm. So epigenetic effects um, can actually depress you. And again, hate to come back to the infection in heavy metals, but there's a clear association shown between high heavy metals levels and mental problems. And that has been shown actually, guess what? For the veterans and military personnel who are listening to this show, this is really important. High levels of heavy metals from being exposed in the field during combat and on the firing range. And so lead, cadmium, you know, all this stuff uh, coming out of the gun uh, and being discharged and you're breathing that stuff. And so uh, that has, it's been shown that there's a connection uh, between that and mental distress. So mm -hmm. that's, the, uh, that's the connection. And the other way around is that mental stress can trigger epigenetic effects. So it mm -hmm. works both ways. It's a great question. Kathleen. Mm -hmm. Ah, so so the exposure from firing guns repeatedly is enough to have an effect to increase your metal heavy metal load. Yeah, firing ranges. They have to close a lot of the firing ranges to clean up the lead that's on yeah. the firing range. So imagine what what people are breathing. So the, yeah, that's this is a, a real uh, problem. And very recently the military has actually severely lowered its acceptable levels of exposure on these firing ranges, which I might add is a whole lot better than the FDA has done by being completely inactive mm -hmm. on putting in regulations, limiting the amount of heavy metals in baby food. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there you have the military ahead of the civilian agency in actually, you know, proactively doing something about this. Absolutely. So Kathleen, that might ex might explain why I'm so strange because I fired <laughs> thousands of rounds on a firing range in in my military service. I was a part time soldier in Rhodesia, and every every time we went in, well, first basic training, and every time we got called up for our four, six, eight weeks at a time, several times a year, we'd pump off a few more hundred rounds yeah, sure. off the firing range and with Peter, no no ear protection either. <laughs> yeah, sure. And Peter, let me ask you a question: Have you ever been tested? No. Well. Get with the program. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and by the way, um, you know, the, the, the traditional testing, and again, we discussed this on the previous program, so I won't get into it too much. Traditional testing doesn't work too well. You have to have a little bit of chelation thrown into the mix for about 20 minutes. And then what they do is they measure uh, what you pee out uh, after, you know, a, 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 over a period of six hours. Um, and, you know, I've had that done and I was like, mm, OK, got to do something about that. Uh, and <laughs> almost all of us, the, the, the American Heart Association has said that low levels of these metals are a real problem. So, yeah, people should get tested and they can uh -huh. uh, get tested. There's no question about it. There has to be uh, when we're talking about epigenetic effects, there has to be a whole program built around this. And, and people yeah. are starting to build those programs of awareness what you do, how you're affected, what you can do about it. It's its really exciting stuff. Absolutely. Mm, very good. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're yeah. very conscious of your time. Yes. So, yes. Kath Kathleen, mm -hmm. back to you. Um, well, can uh, epigenetic expressions be – well, you, you actually went into this about the uh, epigenetic yeah. expressions being changed. And what's one tip you could give us to improve – to improve our lives with respect to epigenetics? What can we do today? Well, I would say the first thing is learn. There's a huge amount out there yeah. about epigenetics. Mm -hmm. You just need to look for it. And not just the scientific stuff. I, again, hey, everyone out there should do this when, they, when, when the program finishes, okay? Uh, go to chat GTP uh, or perplexity and say, could you please explain epigenetic effects to me in simple language and give me five examples of how it affects my life? <laughs> okay, it's really wow. simple. And in 10 seconds, you'll get the answer. Okay, so, very good. So that's yeah, my advice. That. My advice is, you know, use AI to teach yourself about what how what this stuff is. Absolutely. Excellent. So, So Doug, <laughs> oh my goodness, how do people contact you? 
Well, they can reach me actually on um, email at info at calcify.com. I-N-F-O at C-A-L-C-I-F-Y uh, dot uh, com. And uh, of course, they can also buy the book. <laughs> yes. Just why, why you mentioned the book. Give us give our audience a title again, please. Yes. Yeah, funny thing okay. you should say that. I've got it right here. <laughs> ah, good. Let's have a look at it. Okay. It's Discovering the Nature of Longevity, Restoring the Heart and Body by Targeting Hidden Stress, like heavy metals, infections, and all those things that have epigenetic impacts on us. Excellent. Excellent. And it's available from Amazon and most it's other available from Amazon, yeah. And if you go into your local bookstore and you ask for it, they can get it. Okay. Excellent. We will make sure everybody knows about that. Thank you very much, Douglas. And a quick message before we go to our audience, you've seen and heard another brilliant guest today on, on a fascinating subject, and he's encouraged you to use AI to find out more about it. Make sure you don't miss out on our future guests that we've got coming up. We've got more exciting guests. Hop onto our website, theyakishow.com, and hit the purple button. Get on our mail list, one email a week, to tell you what's going on with our guests. That's it for me. Thanks, Douglas. Thanks for listening. Back to Kathleen to close up. Yes. Well, thanks again, Douglas. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on our show. And uh, thank you all again for tuning into our show. If anyone is interested in being a guest, please visit us at theyackingshow.com. All you need to do is go to the contacts tab where you will find a short application form and we would love to hear from you. So until next time, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.